<laughs> Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Bonus Perspective, the series where I play a game start to finish while providing my personal opinion and insight along the way. Think of a Let's Play series mixed with a game review, but condensed and smashed into one video. In this episode, we're going to be playing the absolutely charming title, Stray. Stray is an indie, platforming adventure, puzzle-solving game developed by Blue 12 Studio and published by Annapurna Interactive. It was just released in July of 2022, and for some reason went completely under the radar for me until just recently. Even though this game's only been out for a few months at the time of recording this, the reviews for it are absolutely insane, with an overwhelmingly positive 10 out of 10 status on Steam. As soon as I saw this title pop up, I knew I had to play it. I just wasn't sure what format I wanted to use. After consulting with you guys on YouTube, though, an episode of Bonus Perspective just barely won with a majority vote, and here we are. We start the game and are immediately thrown into a short cutscene showing us alongside all of our cat friends. It's clear that the world that we're being tossed into is post-apocalyptic in a sense, as all the industrial structures around us are run down and overgrown with vegetation. I take a moment to run around and get myself accustomed with some of the controls, and oh my god, I'm a cat! Now I feel that I should mention at this point that I'm personally not a fan of cats in real life. There's always the age-old debate of cats versus dogs, but ultimately we all have our preferences for the reasons that we do, and not much will change that. But I have to say that so far this game is absolutely charming. Our cat's animations are perfect, and you can really tell that this game was a passion project for the company. In fact, that becomes more and more evident as the game progresses. So many aspects of gameplay are purely fluff, simply there to entertain you and immerse you into the experience of playing as a cat lost in an abandoned world. After playing with our cat friends for a few moments, we take a little nap together on a piece of cardboard and wake up the following morning to this adorable cutscene. Now this introduction to the game serves a few different purposes. One, it shows us our current life as a stray cat trying to survive in an unforgiving world, and two, it serves as a very well-crafted tutorial that never feels like a tutorial. I'm a huge fan of games that introduce mechanics naturally and puts them to use immediately in-game, as opposed to information dumps that don't become relevant until later. Stray does a fantastic job at introducing mechanics naturally and fluidly, and not just in the beginning, but the entire game. We're taught how to climb onto surfaces, interact with the environment, and speak to our fellow cats by meowing. The platforming in this game reminds me a lot of that from the Sly Cooper games, which if you're a fan of the channel, you know that I'm a massive fan of. When climbing onto surfaces and walking across tight spaces, your cat is locked onto that surface until you decide to transition to a new platform. I greatly enjoy parkour systems like this, and can't stress enough about how well it works with a game that's been built like this. Not too long into our cat adventures, though, we find ourselves in a dangerous situation. We wake up inside of a dark tunnel system, injured and distressed from the event. Our cat is walking with a limp and our meow has went from playful to that of a scared and vulnerable creature. This was such a nice touch to the storytelling aspect of the game, and in my opinion it was implemented in the best way possible. By that I mean it only lasts for a short amount of time. It was only used to add to the story and not limit the gameplay experience. After a quick catnap, we wake up rejuvenated and need to find a way out of here. Pacing is something that this game excels at. I never felt restricted or limited by my abilities or the world around me, but rather only slowed down by my own curiosity and willingness to, for lack of a better term, f*** around. So much of the world is interactable, with rigid body objects polluting the environment and just begging to be pushed around. 
After exploring for a bit, we find a way out of the tunnels and enter into the dead city. We're instantly greeted by these creepy little mutated creatures that scurry across the city street, foreshadowing what awaits us ahead. Now as it stands right now, we're pretty defenseless, and we only have our speed and agility to aid us as we progress into the city. I'm unsure what all can be discovered through exploration, so I take my time to explore the environment as much as possible as we move along. We start to notice security cameras looking at us as we go along, before coming across this wall of television screens guiding us ahead. In the next room I discover a bucket and oh my god I can pick it up with my cute little cat mouth, that's adorable! It turns out that this bucket is actually used to stop a ventilation fan above us and allows us to progress forwards. So remember before when I said that this game provides tutorials naturally without feeling forced? This is a prime example. We're presented with a bunch of paint cans precariously placed on the edge of these rooftops, and upon approaching them you're greeted with a prompt to push them off the ledge. You know, as a cat would. This game didn't tell us to do this, but rather our own curiosity pushes us to do it. This mechanic is then used shortly afterwards to break some glass down below us, essentially making this mechanic necessary to solve a puzzle. Small little touches like this are what makes this game so charming, like the blue paint sticking to our paws and leaving behind footprints, and the ability to do cat stuff. What do I mean by that? I mean absolutely f***ing up these rugs, playing with dangly things, and drinking from every water source available. None of this stuff actually matters or plays a part in the story, but it's just introduced to make the game that much more charming and enjoyable. Outside the room we find a bucket with a counterweight system and decide to hop inside. This is adorable. I love it. Just ahead we find a robot lying in the city street being eaten by those creepy mutant things. We can't save them, so we just push onwards and are greeted by a short cutscene. shit just got real and we have to haul ass through the city while trying to avoid being overwhelmed. The movement feels so natural and fluid in this moment, and if you're not completely sold on the idea of being a cat after playing this section, then I don't know what could convince you. We jump inside of a small room and see more televisions prompting us to push onwards. Lights and signs all through the city blink and flash to guide us, which is yet another example of the game holding our hand without actually feeling like it's holding our hand. The puzzles in this game are simple, yet extremely fun to complete. Oftentimes the solution is pretty obvious and typically involves us moving or interacting with certain things in the environment. In this case, we need to crawl inside the barrel and roll it into position so we can climb on top of it. Now I could spend a lot of time talking about the platforming in this game, as it's a huge component of gameplay and something that we experience constantly, but for the sake of keeping this video relatively condensed, I plan on skipping past most of it. Just know that we can leap from most surfaces, walk across narrow beams, climb through small spaces, and interact with certain objects to cross gaps. After working our way through the city, we enter this small room with a ventilation fan running. Instead of blocking the fan this time though, we can remove the battery cell against the wall to shut off its power. Doing this prompts me to do a little happy dance. The next room is a tiny apartment that we can explore and do cat stuff. Like clawing the rug, changing the radio station, or more importantly, walking across the keyboard, which turns out is what we're meant to do. You see, all of those lights and signs that have been guiding us along the way have been stemming from this computer, presumably some kind of AI that needs our help. We can communicate with it by walking across the keyboard and pressing the enter key. The AI tells us that it needs a body, so we head into the next room and get to work. Scattered around the room are batteries attached to various devices, all of which can be obtained by acting like a cat. I love this so much. The game developers found such an interesting way of taking their game's idea and bringing it to life with simple puzzle solving elements. After finding all four of the batteries, a nearby door slides open and we proceed inside. Up on the top shelf we find a drone companion box and decide to push it off like any typical asshole cat would do. We slap that little guy on the platform that we powered and watch him come to life. This little drone is now a vessel for the AI that was helping to guide us through the city, and essentially becomes our companion throughout the story's campaign. Now, B12 requires a lot of power to operate, so we have to wear this little vest in order to keep him powered up. After putting on the vest, this happens.
I can't even describe how much I busted out laughing at this in real life when I first experienced it. It serves as just another example of how much the developers clearly loved this project. B12 basically serves as an inventory, a flashlight, and a translator for us throughout the entire game. The dichotomy between us as an agile cat and B12's guidance and support is phenomenal. I never thought that this kind of relationship would work, but somehow it does. Incredibly well. B12's memory is scattered, so much of the story moving forwards revolves around restoring his knowledge of the world and in turn teaching us about it as well. We find a code written on the wall in the nearby room, use it to open up a doorway leading outside, and ride this little bucket across the gap. B12 tells us that he remembers the outside and that he promised someone he would go there, but he's a poor historian and apparently didn't take notes, so we're kind of in the dark here. We find a sign pointing towards a safe zone, which sounds so lovely right about now. We hop into an area known as the slums and see a robot just ahead. Upon approaching him, he freaks out, sounds the alarm, and begins to run. It's clear that they're more afraid of us than we are of them. Like black bears, except ones with cubs. They'll f*** you up. After all of the robots flee and begin to hide, only Samurai Jack remains to speak with us. We confront him and B12 translates between us to allow for communication. He says that we're no Zerk and we're welcome to stay in the city as long as we don't eat anyone. This lets us know that Zerks are the little mutant critters that scurry around and are clearly feared by more than just us. We speak with the Guardian and show him a picture of the outside. He tells us to talk with a guy named Momo who lives in the building with the orange sign. So at this point, we're inside of a small town that is otherwise an open world experience. There are loads of NPCs to talk to, items to find, and cat things to do. We have our objective, and before even starting this game, I told myself I was going to stick to the storyline for the sake of progression, but god damn it, I got completely lost in this game's charm. I spent countless hours exploring and enjoying everything that Stray has to offer, and while I plan on cutting most of it out of the video, I'll try my best to include the highlights. Just down these stairs we find the town's merchant, so to speak. He barters certain objects for other objects, putting in place an economy that would otherwise not exist. Now at the time, I didn't know what any of this stuff was, but I was sure it was useful in some way or another. I later discovered that one of the items is essential to the storyline, while the other two were more for completionists of the game. This town is quite daunting at first. While it doesn't seem to be that massive on paper, it has so many layers to it with the way the game is built. We're able to scale and climb nearly every surface, crawl under tight spaces, and enter pretty much every building with a bit of puzzle solving. We make our way into the bar and find a music sheet on top of a table upstairs. I'm not sure what these are used for yet, but it's best to collect it for the future. We also find a bowl of soup on this tabletop that B12 can scan to recover some of his memory. From what I can tell, B12's memory recovery is a secondary component of the game, and isn't necessary to progress the core storyline, but I still tried my best to unlock all of the memories that I could along the way. I don't plan on showing all of them for the sake of saving time, but I kept my little eyes peeled, don't you worry. Down the street we stumble across a robot named Grandma who loves to knit, and will trade us a poncho if we can bring her some electric cable. Now we already know that the merchant sells this through our exploration, we just have to find the currency to buy it. Further up the street, we find another memory for B12 and a soda machine, which we can slap with our cute little cat paw to find an energy drink. We already know that these are one of the currencies that the merchant accepts for some of the other items, so goals are being established, people. Goals are being established. We start working our way towards the orange sign in the effort to find Momo, but I won't lie, it took me a while. Mostly because I got sidetracked by exploration and cat stuff, but also because I couldn't quite figure out how to get up there. One thing I did discover was these two robots tossing cans of paint back and forth. We speak with Vapora, who seems concerned about dropping the paint. So naturally, like the asshole cat that we are, we start meowing uncontrollably to distract him and make him drop it. This inadvertently causes the nearby store owner to burst out of his building in a fit of rage, which conveniently for us gives us access to his shop in the near future. We work our way inside of another building high up in the city and discover another music sheet, followed by a notebook by someone named Clementine. Now, unbeknownst to me, most of the items I was finding were actually crucial to progressing the story, so none of this was time wasted at all. Flash forward a little bit and we find another can of energy drink and stumble our way into the library. 
Now, of course, we capitalize on the ability to do more cat stuff, but we also find another sheet of music and find some keys on a mattress in the back room. We use these keys to open up a hidden safe in the library and uncover another notebook, this time by someone named Doc. After exploring for a bit longer, I decide to investigate the damage I caused by dropping that bucket of paint. Now, the store owner was super pissed, but I was able to stroll right into his shop and locate some super spirit detergent, which, if memory serves me right, was one of the items that the merchant needed. We explore the rest of the shop in typical cat fashion and decide to go cash this in to see what we get. The detergent allows us to buy the electric cable, which we can now cash in at Grandma for that sweet poncho she promised. I also decide to spend one of our cans of energy drink on the sheet of music, figuring I would probably need it in the near future. I haul my furry little ass back to Grandma's house to cash in on the poncho, although after purchasing it I have no idea what to do with it. I thought it was going to be a cute little sweater for me to wear, but this wasn't the case. I guess only time will tell. We stumble across another vending machine and loot the second can of energy drink, which means we only need one more to purchase that last remaining item that the merchant sells. Close by we find a robot named Morusk... M M Moruski? He's a musician. As you may have guessed, he takes great interest in our sheets of music that we've been collecting and finally gives us the incentive to gather them all. Now, upon giving him a sheet of music, he plays the track that the sheet provides, essentially unlocking some of the game's soundtrack. I thought this was a really cool way to expand on the music of the game, and while it plays no part in the story's progress, it provides some extra incentive to explore, which I'm all for. I would let you guys hear the music as it's being played, because some of it's quite good and relaxing to listen to, but I'm afraid that the music might be copyright protected, and I don't want to risk getting demonetized over it. Instead, just imagine something like this being played. After cashing in all of our music sheets, we find this safe buried in a nearby pile of rubble. A piece of paper attached to the front of it tells us to follow the numbers, but I'm not sure what to do with this yet, so we're just going to ignore it for now. I try to get myself back on track by heading towards the building with the orange sign. On top of one of the rooftops we find a ventilation shaft with a battery attached to the side of it, which can be removed to stop the fan from running. We hop down inside to explore and see what we can find. After knocking over some of the stacked boxes, we find another notebook belonging to someone named Zabalthazar. Z b b Zibalt? B Baltazar? I don't know. In order to leave the apartment, we have to claw the window blind downwards in order to force it to retract back up and allow us to escape out the window, which is just awesome. So it was about this time that I decided to really buckle down and try to advance the story. It turns out that you can just climb straight up the building with the orange sign, and I have been completely overlooking it this whole time. We jump through Momo's window and trigger a short cutscene. Now, Momo seems super bummed, but we show him the picture of the outside to see if he can help. He mentions that he and his friends wanted to go to the outside, but they're all gone now. He tried to contact them, but his transceiver doesn't work. He gives us his notebook to try to help us out, and it bears a striking resemblance to the other notebooks we've been collecting. B12 suggests that we should show him the other notebooks, which turns out is a critical part of progressing the storyline and convincing Momo to help us. Haha! <laughs> I knew that all that exploration and cat stuff was worth it! Momo gets to work on fixing the transceiver and tells us that we have to install it at the top of the tallest building in the slums. So onwards we must travel! Go, cat! Show them how catable you are! Look, if you think the cat puns are stopping anytime soon, you're out of your goddamn mind. So we're on the rooftops now, and this place is scary. There are zerks everywhere, and given that we have no way to fight them right now, it's just a matter of kiting them around and avoiding their attacks. This pretty much applies for the whole level, as we're just tasked with traversing the rooftops while avoiding getting overwhelmed. For the sake of time, I plan on skipping most of the platforming in this level, but let me just say that it's really enjoyable. The game is now combining our knowledge of rolling barrels, walking across tight spaces, climbing to higher surfaces, and using B12 to interact with electrical devices. It's a very strange sense of power progression unlike most games out there, and I quite like it. We work our way deeper into a construction site that has become absolutely overrun with zerks and bacterial growth. Upon trying to parkour my way out of this area, I get overwhelmed and experience my first death of the game. It's sad, but fortunately not too gruesome to look at. The second time around is the charm and we successfully climb our way off the base floor. Now for the second floor. 
This one has a bit more puzzle solving to it, but like the other puzzles so far, it's pretty simple and just a matter of kiting and parkouring. We roll this barrel out of the fenced-in area so that we can stand on it to ascend higher, but after climbing up here I realized that I missed a B12 memory, so I backtrack to acquire it. On the very top of the construction site is an elevator that we have to activate by jumping on top of a lever, and oh my god, that is adorable! The only problem is the elevator is moving really slow, and we've got hordes of zerks coming at us. It all comes down to a matter of kiting. One might even say, a matter of kitten. <laughs> Get it? Ah, oh, kill me. Anyways, we reach the top of the building and slap that transceiver onto the panel board to witness the antenna powering up. We're greeted by this slow, sweeping shot of the slums area below and the city up top, which is quite wonderful to look at and really shows off the game's art style. B12 tells us that the outside used to be unlivable due to harsh conditions, but if it's where we came from, then it must be safe now. We hop in this bucket and ride it down from the rooftop into Momo's apartment. Inside, we find a note on Momo's TV telling us to meet him in the bar. Now, before we can set out to do this, though, cat stuff! We meet Momo at the bar, who has hooked up the transceiver to a television and pulled us up our own little bar stool. Zabaltazar answers the call and says that they found a way up, that way being through the sewers. A nearby robot named Seamus says that the sewers is not a place that we should be heading towards because it's super dangerous. Apparently, the guy named Doc was Seamus' dad, who was working on an experimental weapon to fight off the Zerks, went off to test it, and never returned. Our new goal is to find a secret lab that Doc had mentioned to Momo, as it's our best chance of finding the weapon to get to the sewers safely. We follow Momo through the streets of the slums up to Seamus' house. The door is locked and he won't speak to us, but Momo thinks that if we show him Doc's notebook, we can convince him to help us. Seamus wants none of this at first, but once he realizes that his father had a secret room somewhere in the flat, he's on board with trying to find it. We ransack the place as best as a cat could and discover a hidden keypad behind a picture, prompting me to do a happy dance. There's a hidden message behind another picture in the flat that reads, Time Will Tell, which confused the hell out of me at first before I realized that there are four clocks on the wall, all of which are set to different times. After this realization, the combination was simple enough. We unlock the hidden door and begin to investigate the room, learning all of the secrets that Doc was stashing away. Notes on the wall indicate that Zerks are sensitive to light, so we can speculate that this was the type of weapon he was working on. We climb up on some shelves to do some cat stuff and uncover a broken tracker that we can use to track down Doc if he's still alive. So now we have to find a way to repair the tracker. The signposts throughout the city list an Elliot programming, which I'm going to take a stab in the dark as the robot that we have to see. We find this doorway and use our adorable little cat paws to knock on the door. Now of course I take the time to ransack the place in the efforts of science, but I don't find much of interest. Upstairs we find Elliot, who's willing to help us repair the tracker, but he can't seem to function properly because he's trembling from being too cold. Wait a second! Poncho! Ha <laughs> ha! My efforts! We give Elliot his sweet new electric poncho, and he effortlessly fixes our tracker for us. I find a plant in the room that sparks another one of B12's memories, and we open up the window blind with our cute little paws. We return to Seamus with a fully repaired tracker, and he begins to use it to track down Doc. The signal seems to be coming from out of the slum area, and with Seamus' help, we can exit the city in search of him. Seamus tells us that he sees Zerk eggs ahead and he can't proceed because they'll eat him, so he gives us a badge that his father will recognize in case we find him. Shortly into exploring, we find another one of B12's memories against the distant wall, before reaching an area known as the Dead End. This section gets your heart pumping, as Zerk start pouring out of every direction and we have to run for our lives. This section really makes us think on our feet, and at one point in time we even have to kite all of the Zerks in a big circle just so that we can get under the stairs. Now, fortunately, we survived this trial in our first attempt, as otherwise it would have been a catastrophe. <laughs> oh, God. We get through a short section of platforming and find ourselves in a fast moving cart plummeting down a trench. It's short lived, but the tiny sections like this throughout the game really give it character. We even end up with a slight limp after a large fall, but we're a cat, so a couple licks later and we're fine. 
Platforming is the name of the game until out of the corner of my eye I notice this little fence is damaged and we can crawl through it. A hidden B12 memory can be found here, which kind of has me worried that I've missed little nooks like this in the past. The next area is a tiny section of the city where we can find an electrical generator that is unoperational, with electrical wires leading to somewhere. Now, I've seen the Back to the Future movies, and if we're looking for a guy named Doc, he's more than likely going to be at the other end of these wires strapped to a DeLorean. We follow the wires into this house where we can see Zerk's caged underneath of a light source. If this isn't Doc's house, then I don't know where is. Downstairs, we find the man himself and decide to be a complete asshole like usual. He sees the badge that Seamus gave us and recognizes us as a friend. He says that he came out here to test a defluxer, but it didn't go as planned and he's been trapped out here ever since. He doesn't know how to escape and we need to help him. We find a giant spotlight thing sitting on a desk that I decide I need to push with my little cat paw, prompting him to learn us a lesson. He explains to us that this was a device that he was working on to kill Zerks, but it needs power. The generator in the courtyard could work, but we have to replace the fuse inside of it. I do a bunch of cat stuff in his house, find another one of B12's memories, and head upstairs to continue our mission. We know where the generator is because we passed it on the way in. He warns us that starting it up is going to be bad, okay? So get ready for Zerks. With his giant death light operational again, he starts to fry all of the Zerks as I run back towards his house. He decides to install the defluxer onto B12 so that we can use it to kill Zerks on the fly. How he was able to mount that massive thing on our tiny little drone, I have no idea, but I'm so caught up in the game right now that I don't give a shit. He does tell us to be careful using it with such a small power source, as it will overheat easily. Outside, we get to test it on some Zerks on the other side of this fence, signaling yet again a situation where something is introduced and then immediately used organically. We solve a couple simple puzzles, climb into a vent, and proceed inside of this building. Now, I wasn't quite aware of just how fast the defluxer overheats, and I end up microwaving our cat the first time. But we have nine lives, so it's all good. We unlock the door for Doc, save him from a horde of Zerks, and find the door entering back into the slums where he can be reunited with his son. It's incredible to me that even though there are no spoken lines of dialogue in this game, we feel immediately connected with the different characters. It's quite an impressive feat to pull off, especially when you only have sound effects, actions, and demeanors to work with, but it's something that I think the developers excelled at. We're thanked for saving Doc and told that Momo is waiting for us by the sewers. Before we do that though, I had some more music sheets to give the musician, and some really important cat stuff to do. I mean, who else is gonna take care of this? Seriously! Upon approaching the entrance to the sewers, we're told that Momo is waiting for us in the boat to leave, but once we've left, the door will close behind us and we can't return. This tells me that if I want to purchase that last remaining item from the merchant, unlock that safe in the alleyway, and find the remaining music sheets, I better do it now before we leave. I decide to start with the safe, as we already had at least one clue on what to do. The note that was attached to the safe was written in binary code, and who better to translate it than our recently ponchoed friend Elliot? We hand him the note and he quickly deciphers it to Doofer Bar, which is the bar in town. So, I follow the lead up and discover the code hidden behind a picture on the wall. 1283. With this code in paw, we run back to the safe, type it in, and get awarded with another music sheet that we quickly trade off to our good friend the musician. Now, I won't lie to you guys. After this point, I spent a solid hour searching out the remaining sheets of music and the last can of energy drink that I needed for the merchant. I found a few of B12's lost memories in some tight places and stumbled across some more sheets of music, but I had a heck of a time finding that last can of energy drink. At one point, I even grabbed the spare battery cell that was powering the ventilation fan on the rooftop, thinking that maybe I could use it to power up a vending machine, but I had no luck in this endeavor. I did play with a TV remote a lot and found a sweet sleeping spot in the library, but not much progress was being made. Eventually, our efforts finally paid off, as we found the final music sheet hidden in Momo's apartment building. I returned to the musician with our haul and he awarded us with a music badge, which from what I can tell is simply a completionist type of reward. The only item left to find was a can of energy drink, which took me a very long time to locate, but eventually I stumbled across it sitting on an overhead balcony. 
We rushed over to the merchant to exchange our goods and were rewarded with another memory for B12. From what I could tell, this was the slums completed, and we could proceed forwards with the storyline into the sewers. We walk through the tunnel leading towards the sewers and find Momo waiting for us on a small wooden raft. We hop aboard and begin drifting through the darkened sewer tunnels. From the game's story so far, we know this place to be long since abandoned and completely overran with Zerks. The ride into the sewers is paced perfectly in my opinion. It's this slow approach to an impending danger. A calm before the storm, if you will. The game developers really knew how to build suspense and expectations with their levels. We discover that the defluxer can be used to force hatch zerk eggs and fry them to a crisp, which I'm guessing is going to be super important moving forwards. The sewers start to open up into a larger chamber with zerk sitting overhead, foreshadowing what's to come. We reach a large metal door blocking Momo from proceeding, but our cute little furry ass can fit underneath of it with no problem. This section of the sewers gives us some strong Capcom vibes. What do I mean by that? I mean walls covered in living, bacterial flesh, goo, egg sacs, slimy sex noises, and just a general sense of we ain't in Kansas no mo. We find another B12 memory in an off the beaten path location and platform away over pits of doom death. I'm really starting to get the hang of the defluxer at this point, and haven't microwaved our cat in quite a long time. We jump onto this lever to open up some more of the sewers and fight off hordes of zerks as they come barreling straight for us. The sewer seems to be getting worse and worse the further we go in, which is made all the more evident by the grotesque room of fucking eyeballs staring directly at us, what? This room is terrifying, and not at all what I was expecting from a game like this, but they somehow found a way to make it work. The final section of this level has us running around an open area with four quadrants to activate some switches and open up the metal door blocking our way. Zerks keep falling from the ceiling and hatching from the eggs all around us, so we gotta keep on our cat toes. All in all, it was pretty easy, and we open up the door to reap our reward. Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. In retrospect, the reward was pretty minimal compared to the danger that we were about to face. And here we are again, Midnight Club Cat Edition. B12 burned himself out using the defluxer to save us, so we're completely defenseless against the never-ending hordes of zerks pouring out of every direction. Somehow we managed to pull this off on our first attempt and nudge our little friend back to life. We exit the sewers through a large metal pipe and approach a friendly looking robot on the edge of a strange city. He recognizes us as the outsider that made contact with him earlier and tells us that Zabaltazar is meditating at the top of the village. This place is called Ant Village, for the record, and looks absolutely amazing. It's a ramshackle, towering little shantytown occupied by robots that have escaped the slums. Upon entering the village, B12 has a revelation that he is the scientist that we've been looking for, and that before he died he uploaded his consciousness into a computer. His memory is still scattered and all of the details aren't clear, but this realization really impacts him. He basically shuts down and says that he doesn't feel like talking right now, which means that we just lost our cat to bot translator. We're left to explore in village on our own, which mostly involves just being an asshole. We find Zabaltazar meditating towards the top of Ant Village. He tells us that Clementine lives in Midtown now, and that if we want to see the outside, she would be the one to see. He gives us a picture with her address written on the back of it, and tells us to climb to the top of Ant Village when ready to leave. D12 says that he's feeling better now, and that we have the option of either exploring Ant Village or leaving to head to Midtown. Naturally, my curiosity gets the better of me, and we decide to explore for an ungodly amount of time, uncovering some more of B12's memories and getting into some cat mischief. Much to my surprise, there wasn't near the level of discoverables in this town like there was in the slums. In fact, the only thing I was able to find was a gardener lady named Malo looking for three different colored plants. I found the yellow plant, and in the editing process I realized that I passed up the red plant, but I'm not sure where the purple plant was. I figured I could always try exploring more later, as in the slums when we went into a new area we would always return to the hub city between plot points, but unfortunately this wasn't the case this time. 
I ended up leaving Ant Village before finding all of the plants and was unable to return to discover the rest. My best guess is that we would have been rewarded with another B12 memory, but I'm not positive on that. Regardless, we climb up out of the shanty town and proceed forwards with the story. We find ourselves inside of an abandoned subway station connected to Midtown, where we're supposed to go find Clementine. We explore the subway station, but alas, there is nothing of value here for this little cat. Very shortly after exiting the subway, we stumble across a wanted poster with none other than Clementine's mug slapped up on it. Apparently, we're not the only ones looking for her, as she's wanted by the local policing authority, the Sentinels. These guys have a bit of a reputation for imprisoning other robots for ungodly amounts of time for mild offenses, so they're not a group to be trifled with. Upon speaking to this robot who's being actively apprehended, he tells us that Clementine is more than likely in the residence area of the city. It's an understatement to describe how alive Midtown feels the first time that we set our cat eyes on it. It's a big, bustling city full of life and neon lights that will straight up rape your retinas. One might even say that you would end up with cataracts. Think of New York City meets South Korea meets Nar Shadda from Star Wars, and that's basically Midtown. It's comparable in size to the slums, but I would say there's less vertical height here in comparison. We jump into the shop and work our way into the back room to find a code on the wall. 2458EDOC. Okay, there's a safe up here. Let's try typing in 2458. Nope. Huh. Oh, wait, I get it. EDOC. Code backwards. So the code is backwards. 8524 does the trick, and we loot a cat badge that visually changes our cat's little vest. Now, just like in the previous towns, I spend a lot of time exploring, and inevitably end up discovering a lot of the areas that I would need to head to for future plot points. While it was a huge time sink to play the game like this, I was able to solve problems later on relatively quickly because I was familiar with the town and its inhabitants. Everything from the bar, to the nightclub, to the clothing store, to food vendors, to military facilities had all been scoped out by this little cat on his reconnaissance missions. I mean, this is some important shit, alright? Eventually, I decided to progress the storyline further by locating the residence district where Clementine could hopefully be found. In the middle of the complex are three dudes standing around. The one tells us it'll give us a cassette tape if we destroy the three cameras around the area that the Sentinels have put into place to spy on people. I remember there being a boombox in the clothing store that a cassette tape could be placed inside, so I feel like this is something that we have to do. Upstairs, we find a cardboard box that we can hop inside, which I didn't realize at the time was the game's subtle way of introducing another crucial mechanic in the near future. I just wanted to sit in a box. We take out all the security cameras one by one, but decide to collect the reward later on since we had already found Clementine's apartment. We hop inside to see plant life everywhere and hear music playing from another room. A few steps in and we stumble into Clementine. We show her the picture that Zabaltazar gave us, and she recognizes us as a friend. She states that she has been looking for a way into the outside ever since she left Ant Village, but the Sentinels are always on patrol. She asked us to follow, but you guys know that I had some cat stuff to do first. After we finished our important business, we discussed further plans with Clementine. She states that she wants to get the old subway running, but we need an atomic battery to power it. The only people in town that have a battery like this is Necocorp in one of their factories. She tells us to search the town for a robot in a bomber jacket wearing a gold chain, and present him a note that she had written on for us. Before we do that though, we decide to collect on our security camera destruction. Like I mentioned before, I knew that the clothing shop had a boombox in the back room that I could put this into, so that's where we went. After slipping it in the boombox, it started to play some ungodly loud music and distracted the shop owner away from his typical standing spot. I decided to capitalize on this by quickly running out to the shop, but alas I couldn't find anything to interact with. At least not yet. We leave the shop and begin scouring the town for the robot that Clementine described. It took a bit of time, but eventually we found this guy named Blazer that fit the description. He tells us that the Necocorp factory is just ahead, but we can only get inside if he disguises himself with a worker's jacket and helmet. Now, it was our job as a cat to acquire these items, of course, but luckily I knew just where to start. Now that this section of the storyline had been updated, I was able to re-enter the clothing store and take a worker's jacket displayed in the front. This is the reason that we had to distract the store owner into the back room. The worker's hat could be found just next door in the hat store, but the store owner wouldn't let me inside. He was waiting on two workers to deliver and stock his shelves, but the one was apparently drunk in the local bar. 
I took this opportunity to be a complete asshole again by waking him the f up and following him back to the hat store. Now, remember before when I was messing around with the boxes in the residence area? Well, now that becomes important, because I need to hide inside one of these boxes while the worker carries me inside. Once we infiltrated the store, the worker's hat was as good as ours, and we pawed our way out through the nearby vent. We returned to Blazer with loot and paw, hopped inside the Necocourt box, and walked right past their security measures. Inside the factory was a different beast altogether. This game went from lighthearted platforming and adventure to straight up Metal Gear Solid stealth missions. I know I made this comparison once before already, but this game bleeds inspiration from the Sly Cooper franchise. Everything from the quirky characters, platforming style, and music all seems heavily inspired from other titles, but yet so unique and original in its own right that nothing ever feels ripped off or stolen. Shortly into the factory, we find another robot who lost his keys and needs help recovering them. But I'll be entirely honest, I completely forgot about this side quest and never helped this poor guy out. We have to avoid the sentinel drones patrolling for intruders while progressing deeper into the factory. Some of these obstacles are simple to get past, while others require cat-like reflexes. The game really puts modern-day line-of-sight mechanics and lighting to full use, as at one point we're using the shadows of moving objects to avoid detection from sentinel drones. We reach the room with the atomic battery and bypass the laser security system with our patented barrel technology. Inside the room is a little robot drone that can be put on follow and guided around one of three pressure-sensitive areas surrounding the center. These pressure plates seem to lower the cylinder in the center, but I need a second object to rest on one of the plates. We find another robot drone inside of a caged area and place it on the second pressure plate, allowing us to roll the barrel over the third and collect the atomic battery from the center. Now this does set off some alarms, but we escape in style using a nearby bucket pulley system. We dash back towards Clementine's place, but find it in complete lockdown from the Sentinels. We have to stealth mission our way through the complex and avoid detection from all of the drones patrolling the area. It took some time and some patience, but ultimately we make it through just fine and re-enter Clementine's house. Now she done hauled ass out of here, but she left behind a coded message on the wall stating the answers lie in my stuff, with a depiction of various objects. We basically need to find the object depicted and piece together parts of the sentence to find out where she went. After a bit of searching and loads of cat stuff, we find all of the clues she left behind and piece together a sentence that reads, I'm with Blazer, come to nightclub. Say no more, Clementine, this cat's moves are catagious. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. We run out of the residence and head towards the nightclub, but the bouncer is having none of it. I even tried slipping him a hairball, but for some reason he didn't want it. One of the robots in line says that they may have to climb in the back again, greenlighting our ticket inside. I mean, this isn't the first time I've snuck in the back door, am I right up top? Inside the nightclub is awesome, to say the least. This game is able to go from dark and depressing to bright and bubbly in the snap of a finger, spotlighting just how talented the developers are. We inadvertently find a drink that we can take on the bar counter and ride this dumbwaiter downstairs into a keg room that houses another one of B12's memories. Back at the nightclub, things are poppin', the music is slapping, and the party is bumpin', no cap. Did I get that right? These goddamn kids with their goddamn kid sayings. Against the wall is this robot named Fripp, bragging about a lever that he stole from the DJ's stage. He clearly doesn't want to get caught with it, and is willingly going to exchange it for a drink, which we just so happen to have, <laughs> look at that! On stage, we install the lever onto its rightful place, which allows us to hop on top of this hologram projector and ride it upwards on top of the nightclub. This panel controls the various overhead light structures, which I'm guessing we need to lower in order to get across to the other side. After a little bit of trial and error, we figure it out and work our way across to the VIP room. Now, there's always time to be an asshole, but we don't get long before stumbling across a plot point that no one saw coming. Turns out that Blazer is a bad dude who kidnapped Clementine to lure us here and turned us into the Sentinels for profit. Oh my god, that cat noise was so sad. We awaken inside of a metal cage suspended over top of some water by a chain. Now fortunately for us, the bad guys didn't account for a James Bond-esque escape, so we use our cat momentum to swing the cage's lock into a nearby pipe to free ourselves. Walking into the next room reveals this level as jail. So we got sent to jail. For cat burglary. <laughs> okay, I, I will stop. I will stop, I promise. We platform our way over the nasty waterways and into the holding cells of the jail. Sentinels are patrolling everywhere, and we have to use this level's vertical height to avoid getting caught. At the other end of the jail is Clementine locked behind some bars. 
We can't really communicate with her because we don't have B12 to translate, but actions speak louder than words. It's crystal clear to me that she wants to go mini-golfing with Batman. We fetch the keys to her jail cell and cement her escape, prompting me to perform a short yet victorious happy dance. We begin working our way out of the jail, but we spot B12 being kept behind a secure laser grid. We let Clementine know our intentions through adorable cat noises, and she seems to be agreeable to helping. The game has us dodging laser beams, avoiding patrolling sentinels, and climbing on top of air conditioners, all in the effort to deactivate the security guarding B-12. Now that the laser grid is down comes the hard part, avoiding detection and saving our little drone friend. We wait until just the right moment and snag our little buddy from his prison. Now I thought for sure at one point that I was going to be Chinese food, but luckily I was able to find a line of sight from the sentinel at just the right time. We return to Clementine with B12 in mouth and watch him reboot. We're re-equipped with our snazzy little vest and feel confident in our abilities once more. Little moments like this feel so natural in the game, with characters behaving and responding to each other exactly how you would expect them to. Even the way our cat perches on Clementine's head feels so organic and quirky that you just can't help but smile. This next section tasks us with luring the patrolling sentinel drones into jail cells so that we can trap them. This basically means that I have to get caught, which changes the game's dynamic quite a bit. Instead of stealth and tactics, it's now about speed and reaction times. The first attempt at trapping the sentinel goes perfectly smooth, and we find another one of B12's memories in the center section. The next area, on the other hand, is a completely different story. There are two drones patrolling here, and only one long jail cell against the sidewall. I won't lie, I struggled here, dying a handful of times before finally realizing that, hey, we're a cat, and I can simply walk underneath of the doors even when they're closed. With our newfound knowledge in hand, the task was fairly simple, and we were able to trap both of the sentinels to proceed. We crawl through this vent to unlock the door for Clementine on the other side. Some idiot left the keys to their vehicle in the door of all places, which makes for a very convenient moving cat lift. We unlock the large metal door that was barring our escape, triggering an alarm system to go off and sending swarms of sentinels after us. Fortunately, our cat-like reflexes combined with their stormtrooper aim seals our escape. We speed our way through the streets of Midtown before Clementine reveals that she plans on distracting them while we make our escape and discover the outside for ourselves. This moment was actually quite sad, as our cat voices his distress through the conversation and really brings forth the feels, man. But we can't stop. Not now. Not after everything this poor cat has endured. We venture back into the subway and slap that atomic battery into its rightful position. The subway system comes to life, and we hastily run back towards it with keys and paw. After traveling for who knows how long, we approach the final level of the game, the control room. This place is drastically different than what we're used to. Everything is clean and well kept. There's not a spot of grime, trash, or bacteria anywhere. The robots found roaming around the area all lack originality, speaking with very direct dialogue and no sense of personality. It's clear that their programming and distance from the real world has left them in a state of basic AI, without the development or branching that their counterparts have shown up until this point. After roaming around for a bit, we find a heavily guarded door to the control room. In order to open it up, B12 needs to hack the right side panel while we do cat stuff to the panel on the left. The only problem is, we can't reach it. We find another one of those drones nearby that we can command to follow us and get it into position so we can stand on top of it. Once in place, I claw the living shit out of the electrical wires. When in doubt, cat stuff. Upon entering the room, B12 has a relapse of memory and remembers that there was a plague that afflicted and killed all of the humans, and is the reason that the walled city was created to begin with. An unknown amount of time has passed since then, though, and given how we originally came from the outside, it's likely that the plague has died out. We find a main computer against the distant wall that B12 hacks into. He states that the whole city has been stuck in a lockdown state from a long time ago, and if we disable it, we should be able to leave. Our mission is to turn on all of the computers inside the control room while B12 continues to access the mainframe. How do we turn on said computers, you might ask? Cat stuff!
Once all of the computers are back online, B-12 is able to access the roof control station, but notes that there are several layers of security preventing access to it. B-12 suggests that he can hack the computers if we destroy some stuff, which sounds like a fantastic idea. I get to work on pushing panels, clawing shit, and needing some important looking wires, all in the effort of opening up the walled city that has been closed off for a long time. With each hack that B-12 pulls off, he becomes weaker. It's clear that he might not make it out of the situation in one piece, and by the time we reach the final computer, his drone body is about done for. We carry him over to the workstation where he admits that he knew the hacking process was going to be too much for his little body to handle, but he willingly and knowingly sacrificed himself to ensure the freedom of all the other robots, and more importantly, his favorite cat companion. He apologizes that he won't be able to see the outside with us, but feels adamant in his decision to try to save us and the companions. He removes our vests and completes the hacking process, resulting in one of the game's final cutscenes. Somehow, it's both heartbreaking and uplifting at the same time. B-12's sacrifice was immense, but ensured the freedom of everyone else that had helped us up until this point. After the cutscene ends, we awaken inside of the control room next to B-12's former body. I tried to interact with him, but alas, he was gone. I perched on top of the control room's panels and watched as the walled city was exposed to the open air for the first time in ages. With security protocols abolished, we're able to leave the control room freely into the outside that we've been searching for, launching the game's final cutscene. Ah, I caught that game! Giving me hope for a sequel, I see. So now that we've completed the game in its entirety, it's time for a good old-fashioned pros and cons list. Starting with the pros, Stray's graphics and general art style are wonderful, and I can't say enough positive things about them. The game's developers clearly knew that Stray was going to be multifaceted and convey different emotions along the way. In turn, they chose to use an art style that was flexible for those changes. The game looks realistic, but not too realistic that it loses its charm. The game looks cartoony, but not too much that it feels goofy. The game looks dark and depressing, but not too much that it kills the mood. They struck a perfect visual balance that is rare to see in the world of gaming, and is truly charming to experience firsthand. It's clear that the design team didn't have a ton of assets to work with, but through sheer artistic ability and comprehensive level design, they were able to stretch it out and make everything feel incredible. I never thought to myself, wow, this area looks identical to the last, because it wasn't. Even though it visually might look the same, 
everything about the individual areas in Stray are unique in their own quirky ways. It's hard to describe, you just have to kind of buy the game and try it for yourself to see what I'm talking about. Stray's audio design is superb, and I really wish I could have shown off more of it throughout the video. Unfortunately, I couldn't find confirmation on whether or not the game's music was copyright protected, so I chose to omit most of it. Just know that the music selection was strange, but somehow perfect. Think Spongebob meets sci-fi meets stealth game. And if that sounds f***ing weird, it's because it is. But I wouldn't change a thing. It cued perfectly with the game's storyline and plot points, often picking up during intense action scenes or slowing down during moments of sadness. The sound effects in the game were spot on, and really added to the general sense of being a cat lost in a post-apocalyptic world. Everything from our footsteps to meows to interaction with objects really helped to bring the world to life in so many ways. Stray's gameplay came damn close to complete perfection for me, combining elements and inspiration from so many other games out there while still putting their own unique spin on things. Nothing ever felt ripped off or stolen, but there was always this vague sense of I know this anytime something was introduced. The platforming elements heavily reminded me of those from the Sly Cooper franchise, while the world itself reminded me of the Jack and Daxter series. The stealth elements seemed heavily inspired by Metal Gear Solid or Splinter Cell, while the fast-paced racing scenarios kind of reminded me of Crash Bandicoot. Once again though, nothing felt unoriginal or ripped off, but rather charming, and a bit of a throwback to the games that the developers themselves might have grown up playing. The environments in Stray feel alive and vibrant. Walking into a new town for the first time is a bit daunting, as the level seems so large and full of layers with how the game handles platforming. Most of the interactions with NPCs or objects are fluff material, or made for the completionists out there who strive to accomplish and see everything the game has to offer, which I think is wonderful. There doesn't have to be a shiny reward waiting at the end. Sometimes funny dialogue, easter eggs, or steam achievements are enough, and this game proves that. I spent countless hours enjoying the level design of Stray, and could immediately tell that the developers loved working on this project. I mentioned this earlier in the video, but the pacing of Stray is spot on. The game knows exactly when to push the storyline, and how to introduce new mechanics to players in a natural and organic way. Nothing feels forced, and at no point are there text dumps of information that I'm expected to remember. The game doesn't hold your hand, but it simplifies things enough that it's easy to remember and make progress. There is a general sense of power progression with the ever-expanding puzzle-solving mechanics and introduction of a weapon to fight the Zerks, but that power is stripped away on multiple occasions to bring us back to the harsh reality that we're but a simple cat doing cat things. And lastly for the pros is the story. I found it charming and engaging start to finish. There were a couple of twists along the way with some heartbreaks and moments of sadness, but nothing that felt like it was just made to upset you. The game introduced tragedies, but then relit the will to live with the overarching goal to free ourselves and the companions that have been trapped within the walled city for so long. Our task felt important, yet playful. Suspenseful, yet goofy. Sneaky, but steadfast. I can't say enough good things about the originality of the story and simplicity that complemented it so well. I mean, not even a single line of dialogue is actually spoken in-game, yet we feel immersed and invested in these characters. Now that is storytelling. But with all of the pros comes a few cons, but honestly there's not many. First and foremost, I think the biggest con for people is how short this game is. If you stick to the main storyline, you'd most likely complete this game in about five hours. It took me a bit longer because of my burning curiosity to explore and cat stuff, but that's just how I roll. Personally, I think the length was appropriate for the story being told. It feels complete without feeling drug out, but I could see how some people would be upset by it. After finishing Stray, I was hoping to see an option to dive back into the game following its completion in order to gather everything that I had missed. Unfortunately, I didn't see an option for this, which means that if I wanted to 100% the game, I'd have to play it all over again start to finish and just hope that I'd not only find what I had missed the first time, but also re-find the things that I did from before. Given that some of the areas become locked off and prevent re-entry, this is frustrating for someone who's unsure if they've found everything and feels apprehensive about moving forwards for fear of missing something. Because of this, and the fact that there's not much carryover of collectibles or findables in the game, I feel that it has low replayability overall. And lastly for the cons list are minor graphical glitches and bugs in general. Nothing I encountered was game-breaking by any means, but there were certainly moments where items were clipping inside of each other and rigid body objects were behaving unnaturally. Now this game obviously wasn't shooting for ultra-realism or complete immersion, but these little glitches were distracting at times. None of these visual bugs were constantly present, though. 
For example, I never found any floating objects or items that were defying gravity because of lazy design, but rather only came across glitches that were non-reproducible due to physics and interaction with the environment. So all in all, my opinion of Stray is extremely positive. I bought this game thinking it was going to be something along the lines of Goat Simulator, where it was just goofy and quirky for the sake of being goofy and quirky, but I found so much more. There's fun platforming mechanics, stealth missions, races against the clock, and a storyline that carries weight and depth, all accomplished without the use of any spoken dialogue. The world is vibrant and fun to explore, the characters are interesting and lively, the controls are tight and responsive, and the cat stuff is just mwah, beautiful. I dare say I grew a larger appreciation for cats just from playing this game, and that's saying something. My recommendation is that all of you watching right now go and buy this game to play it for yourselves. While I hope this bonus perspective was comprehensive, I feel like this is one that you have to personally experience to truly appreciate. Plus, it's a rarity nowadays that game designers put this much love and attention into their projects, so you should give them your money regardless just for the sake of supporting such dedication to the craft. We need more games like this, and only gamers can make that happen. So with all that being said, thank you so much for watching! If you enjoyed this episode of Bonus Perspective, then please be sure to leave this video a like down below, subscribe to the channel with notifications on to stay up to date on all of my latest content, join the Discord for a community of like-minded woodland creatures, and please keep leaving me comments because they warm my little Bonna heart. A special thank you goes out to all of the Bonnas who support me on Patreon, you guys are amazing. Thank you again so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.